our podcast is on your journey in music and how you got to where you are now. Um, and if I don't know if you mind talking about uh, the interest band at all or not at all. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Awesome. Sweet. So uh, I guess first tell us about. I read that you're from Baltimore area. Is that where you're born and raised? Yeah, I'm from Baltimore, and I've lived in LA for the past like almost 15 years. Okay. And, what was it like growing up in Baltimore? It's a crazy town. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, it would be hard to describe growing up there in a short, succinct way. But one of the things that really stands out when I think about it is that there was a lot of really interesting music going on there when I was growing up. Like Baltimore and D.C. are kind of a, a group sure. setting. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It's all pretty close there, right? I mean... Yeah. And my my father lived in D.C. some when I was a kid, but the yeah the music scene when I was growing up in in that area was really happening and mm -hmm. had a really big impact on me. So that was that was really cool. That's awesome. And yeah. uh, how how did you get in music? Well, I started playing guitar when I was ten. Oh wow! Um, yeah, who got you, who got, who uh, got you I, the guitar? I just taught myself. I, I I started out by picking up tennis rackets and other guitar shaped things and kind of just acting like I was playing guitar. Okay. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. There was then there was like this toy guitar. It was like a plastic red thing and it had strings on it. It was shaped like a guitar, but it didn't actually make any sound. I would play that too. Okay. And then one year for Christmas, my brother got a guitar and I got a snare drum and I just abrupt. I was you know, I'm his older brother, and I abruptly s stole it and started playing the guitar. <laughs> right on. He ended I... up. A, he ended up a drummer, actually, too. So we kind of switched. Um, and oh, then, so, oh, so he ended up. Being, did you guys jam together and stuff? Yeah, at some sometimes. Yeah, that's cool. Uh, but, but the, but yeah, I mean, I taught myself, and I didn't have anyone around me really that knew anything about it mm -hmm. at first. So no one noticed that I was playing it upside down. Oh, uh, were you lefty? I'm actually right with my right hand, but I play guitar with my left. Oh, and interesting. I, so I play a right-handed guitar left-handed, which is strange. It's oh, like wow. considered backwards or upside down. Like upside down? Yeah, so the, the high E string is, is, actually, on top. is actually on the top, which as a person trying to figure it out that was the way that it felt right to hold it to me anyway but it also made more sense to me that the higher pitch would be on the top higher yeah i don't know yeah no that does make sense i never thought about it that way that's like an interesting concept to think about <laughs> yeah, I, also, I also didn't think about i didn't realize that i had a left that i was ambidextrous or that i had a left-handed part of my brain because the the part that you write with I write with a pen with my right hand and uh -huh. the part that you play on the frets is like writing, especially when you're first starting to play. Cause I teach, right, I, teach sure. guitar now. I teach guitar now and that's something that I always go back to is like when you're first starting your strumming or picking kind of hand is definitely the less articulate one. It's just kind of banging away and your fretting hand is the one that's actually doing like changing and, doing more particular things and also it's like kind of what's controlling the way it sounds more in a way it's like you're writing the story of it with your writing hand i think so that was my writing hand and that's why i started that way and then when it was too late for me to stop playing that way a few months in we went to the music store to get new strings and the guys there were just like what are you doing that's back <laughs> And they, Did you keep playing like that? Yeah, I mean that's how I have only ever played like that. So, but you teach guitar lessons. That's awesome. So, do you show yeah. when you're playing it? Is it backwards to the other the other kids? It's like a mirror. It's like it's like if I was facing you and you're playing, the necks are parallel. Oh it's, right. It's weird. It's like a the way that I I don't know. I guess the way that I figured it out too is kind of like a mirror. Like when I watch someone playing, it's almost as if I see it the way that I would be holding it. So it's like, I look at 
them as if I'm reaching around the guitar. It's it's a weird. It's like That's... a symmetrical thing for me. Yeah, Visual. that makes sense. Um, well, the only other person I've ever seen, or I've only seen one person do that live, is uh, uh, Chris Rowe from the Ataris. He plays a right-handed guitar, left-handed upside down, also. Oh, cool. Yeah, I've never seen that. And I, I know like uh, Dick Dale, famous surf guitar player. He played mm -hmm. like that. Okay. The guy from Pulp Fic the main song from Pulp Fiction, you know, he plays yeah, yeah. like that. Oh, and interesting. That's how a lot of left-handed people start, and usually they get corrected by someone. Mm -hmm. So Jimi Hendrix and Paul McCartney both started that way, but then someone was like, get a left-handed guitar. <laughs> right, right. But usually they can do both. Like, both of them can do both. Uh, Paul McCartney plays the left-handed bass, but he often plays a right-handed guitar upside down, so... It's like a oh, that's interesting. I never noticed that either. Jimi Hendrix kept the body left-handed, but he switched the strings to be. I mean, they right. kept the right-handed. Yeah, yeah, and he flipped the neck, right? So I've I've actually been in a store in a guitar center one time, and there was this Jimi Hendrix model that was made for right-handed people to look like they were playing upside down, like Lefty? Jimi Hendrix. <laughs> so I picked it up, and it was the perfect. It was actually made for me because the strings were the way I liked them, but the body was corrected for me. So, because when you hold it upside down, it's actually like lopsided, like a Stratocaster. Yeah, yeah, so sure. Like, and then the neck would be the the top yeah, of the head of the neck would be pointing yeah. downward. So you have to reach under it to tune it and stuff. So there's weird things about it. And the knobs are, you know, it's like the input jack and then the volume knobs and stuff. Or oh, upside down. Yeah, your arm is always banging into them. <laughs> It's definitely weird. But so by the time I was told that it was wrong, though, it was too late. It was and too also, late. <laughs> also, I had been tuning it. I had been tuning it by ear in my own way. And they kept changing. Like people at the music store would tune it normally. And I would be like, this doesn't make any sense. And I would put it back to how I thought it was tuned. Oh, interesting. So, yeah, I guess I figured out. But. Yeah, it comes up a lot when I'm teaching now that the world of today is just so full of just kind of infinite distractions. I mean, I, I, I deal with that every day trying to get, I have work that I'm trying to get done and I'll be working on music on a computer screen and then all of a sudden I'm looking at conspiracy theories or something like the, <laughs> the, computer, the computer and the phone and all these things are all can pull you off in so many directions. But when I was starting to play, it makes me feel old, but none of that stuff exists mm -hmm. in the late 80s, early 90s, mid 90s, when I was really figuring it out. Mm -hmm. So I had that extra focus that I don't know that if I was a kid today, I would have. Like I've taught, I had this job in LA with this, organization called jail guitar doors and it's like uh wayne from the mc5 oh cool it's his organization it's a nonprofit that teaches music to incarcerated people and when oh, i started doing it and when i started doing it they were expanding into teaching at community centers like teaching kind of a more preventative approach so that we were teaching music and songwriting to groups of young kids anywhere from like a seven or eight year old to a a senior in high school but they would all come together in a group and there was all these kids that were so talented and had so much promise and really would get excited about music but then they would get totally pulled off they would like start looking at their phone in the middle of the oh right i know there's just so, so many like, distractions now <laughs> i feel like i feel like i was blessed to get into it in a time when there wasn't much to yeah, other distracted. Yeah. I mean, technology right. definitely wasn't where it was, even when I was, you know, learning guitar and stuff, which was... Yeah, the way, I mean, even like with recording, the first real recording that I got to do was when I was given a four track after I had been playing music. Sure. <laughs> but before that, I would use these two boom boxes and I would record into one of them and then play that really loud from the other, from one of them and record and play along to that and record that in the oh. other... It was like, and each time you did that, there was this wall of tape hit. But so like that was, that, you know. Yeah, it's, was, it's interesting because like, you know, back then you had to just take such a different approach, like trying to figure out like, 
like you just said, okay, well, I know if I push play and record on this boom box, it'll pick up something around me so I can play. And then it's like, well, now I want to loop that over here. So it's like nowadays, you know, you just have infinite tracks on, you know, logic yeah. or whatever you're using. And I remember having a four track as a kid too. And like trying to figure out, okay, like I can actually record four things onto a cassette tape or, you know, and then you try to bust two of them on and re overdubbing everything. And it's just, it's just such a different world now. Yeah. And the, the record that I'm releasing this week, I made in, in Pro Tools with a friend who's like a genius engineer and producer, mm -hmm. but I had been trying to make it on my own with the four track for a couple of years. So there's oh. all these versions of the songs that I recorded myself with the four track. And then I felt like that wasn't enough track. So then I got a cassette eight track and I recorded a lot of versions of the songs like that. And then I ended up just recognizing that at that point, my recording capabilities were going to limit the, the, the record scope of the record. And I asked yeah. my friend to help me and it's like on a whole other level <laughs> what I could have done myself, but that's still how I record when I record myself is just with this tape machine. So that's like, that's, that, that's stuck with me from the early days of like, that's, that's the language of recording that my brain understands. If I need to use it, if I want to record 40 tracks on a computer, I need someone else to help me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's awesome. Well, okay, so I want to go back to, like, when you started recording these songs, how old were you when you started writing your own songs? Were, like, in the beginning, were you trying to learn other, you know, other people's records and doing yeah. covers, or was that difficult playing upside down? Like, I don't, I would, I would I was, be curious to hear about that. Yeah, I was definitely trying to figure out some music that I was into by ear, but I was also definitely writing stuff from the very beginning. Mm -hmm. And I think part of the way I taught myself was by <clears throat> finding, figuring out certain chords that I liked and then exploring them kind of for hours and hours at a time. Mm -hmm. so that was more like improvisation and writing than, than trying to play something else. But I would always make note of things that I figured out that sounded like something that I knew. So yeah, like right around the time I was getting into it, Nirvana was a thing or like Nirvana getting big on the, world, on the world stage was happening. And I remember uh -huh. being like, I remember seeing their per first performance on Saturday night live, live on television and things like that. That was happening as when I was getting into the guitar. So that would uh -huh. be an example of something that I was learning and, and some of their songs, where like when I figured out how to play it, it was a huge step in knowing how to take something that I hear and figure out how to replicate it on the guitar. Sure. I wonder if I wonder if Kurt Cobain ever learned the same way because he was a lefty guitar player too. I'm pretty sure he started that way too. Yeah, I think everyone that's left-handed first will reach for a right-handed guitar and then possibly like find out that yeah, they, that doesn't they're... work though. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's cool. So, um, well, you know, after you started learning these songs, Nirvana and everything, were, did you, like, start a band? Like, what was the first band you started? I had a lot of, like, I had a lot of bands in my head that didn't actually exist. And I would make, <laughs> I would make these album covers for the band. I love that. <laughs> and, and then these older kids, I was probably in eighth or ninth grade. And these kids that were a few years older than me, reached out to me through my cousin and they were hmm. like we have this band do you want to be in the band and then all of a sudden i was in this band where the kids were you know they were like 17 or 16 or 17 and i was 14 and i oh, started, wow. started playing all these shows with them and practicing with them and that was a really cool band because it was four people and everyone got to write songs and everyone played every instrument. So we would switch like oh, sometimes wow. play bass and sometimes I would play guitar and everyone would switch around. And they, they also turned me on to a lot of music that I didn't know about at that time. They were, it was all an all male band, but I would say it was almost like a riot girl band. Like oh, these sure. guys were like knew about all this kind of like feminist punk music that i was really into but i had never heard of before like 
this band Huggy Bear and Bikini Kill. Bikini Kill, okay. Like stuff like like so they were like we were like these guys but like trying to be like that kind of a band. <laughs> That's <laughs> that was, rad. <laughs> and then, yeah, and then through those people I met other kind of older kids and played in other bands. So it's like I got involved with all these people that were having shows and some of the shows were in basements and some were at school or at a church. And then eventually when I was more like 16 and 17, a bunch of my friends started doing these independent all ages venues that were just basically like an illegal storefront where there would be shows. And I got really involved with that booking other bands and playing shows there. That's that cool. Just that was just locally? Locally and pretty like pretty much in, in Baltimore, but we would go to DC to see shows and um yeah. And the another thing that I thought of when I was talking about the lack of technology and how I was able to focus it was also a time when people were touring and I started touring with these bands that I was in and the way that you would get a show in another city would be you'd look in this like index of where you who you would call and you would call these landlines and hopefully someone would answer the phone or someone's mom would leave a message for their son or something and then someone would call you back and then you would mail a tape through the mail be like I know you haven't heard us yet but here's the tape and you would mail it to them <laughs> yeah then you would show up you know people would show up in Baltimore and they'd be like okay this is where the show is and we're like yeah it's Jeff's house and his parents are out of town so the show <laughs> in the basement you know and it was like and then my bands that I was in started touring and I was in this band called the convocation of and I was the bass player and we did a lot of touring we toured the US a number of times and this guy wow. Tony, this guy Tony who was older than me he was 12 years older than me he still is and he was <laughs> he still he was is. Like, <laughs> still he's still playing guitar he he was like the in the weird underground scene of Baltimore but he he was one of the only people from Baltimore that was known outside of Baltimore like he had records on this label kill rock stars and he was like it's kind of like the Jimi Hendrix of this weird underground scene he was a guitar hero basically okay. and I started, I started playing with him and then I ended up living with him and playing in this band with him for a number of years. And we did a lot of touring in this old van that he had. And yeah, How old was, were you when you first did? I mean, you said you were touring with the, the band prior to joining uh, that, prior to joining the band yeah, with Tony. Or like, how, how like old were you? Before, when, yeah. before starting with him, this other band that I was in, we went to like, Pittsburgh and played a show or we went to North Carolina and played a show, but we never did a real tour. Okay. The first real tour, the first like actual tour that I did was with this band, the convocation of with, with Tony. Mm -hmm. and we went to the West coast during my Christmas break and I got to miss, oh, a, wow. week, miss a week of school to go on tour. And That's pretty cool. at that point. Pretty much that was the end of me caring about school, school. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I went, it was like all I played we played in San Francisco and LA and San Diego and Portland and Seattle we played in Las Vegas on New Year's Eve 1999 wow at this place called the tubes which is like into the millennium 99 in the nine not into 2000 but oh, into 90 into, into 99 yeah. okay 88 nine, 88 or 98 into 90 i got it yeah so we played that night in this place called the tubes which is like an aqueduct like an abandoned aqueduct tunnel system way out in the desert with a generator and a bonfire Whoa. and then we went and then we went into las vegas on new year's eve where there was just like mayhem you're going to see a million people in the streets and like people on all the street signs and lamp posts and we got caught in this crowd got like kind of like not trampled but like everyone was like it was such a wall-to-wall -wall crowd that you actually couldn't just walk you had to kind of like try not to fall over sure, sure. and then we slept and we spent the night in our van we had a lot 
built into the van where we could all sleep. But like, so that I went from just being a high school kid that wanted to play music and to that was like the beginning of the next phase of my life, which was pretty much all about music and touring, seeing where I could go with yeah. physically go like where I could travel with music. That's that's awesome. Well, I've, you mentioned San Diego. That's where I am. I'm curious. Where'd you guys play? <laughs> We played at the Che Cafe. Oh yeah, man! Uh, I wonder a number of times, but that that at that time that was definitely like the kind of places that I'm talking about where I, my friends would run these venues in Baltimore were kind of like part the of that the same circuit. Yeah, where it's like a, it's an all ages venue, and there's vegetarian food, and there's political rally. It's sure. like a under, like the hardcore scene basically. right yeah that's where all the hardcore bands would play when they come to san diego all the, all the san diego bands from this particular scene would come and play in in baltimore and i was mm -hmm. putting on shows for them but that's yeah like bands from the 90s that maybe people have heard of but probably not <laughs> uh, from san diego you mean like do you, could you think of what like locust or were they not around yet oh, yeah well that's late a little bit later like, okay first tour that i'm talking about when i was on my winter break the uh -huh. shows that i played were with them okay yeah that makes sense because they're they like a huge i mean yeah. they i mean obviously they blew up but like that was like their hub yeah was at the chair later on as entrance when i was a solo artist i ended up doing this long tour for a couple months in america and europe with the locust and the yes yeah, yeah, yeah. so it was like oh wow like I was the opener, this one guy with the electric guitar, and then the Locust, and then the Yeah Yeah Yeah. <laughs> but back in the early tours that I did, like the shows that we played in at the Smell in downtown LA, was with the Locust, and it was so many people that we were like thought the floor was gonna cave in. Oh my gosh! But the bands that the San Diego bands that kind of predated that, they're almost like a young more like my age more like my generation but the mm -hmm. guys that were a few years older the bands were like uh one was called antioch arrow okay one was called heroin and this other band was called click it tot Ikitawi. they were like i don't know how to describe their music but it was yeah like, I, haven't, I haven't heard of them but i'm sure they're like the locust, obviously the they're locust, the locust is kind of like an accumulation of all of that stuff turned into something that's more palatable. Okay. The <laughs> locust is more palatable. <laughs> I'm like, wait a minute. <laughs> yeah, these bands were like, I mean, there's words that I hate to use because I feel like they've been ruined, but they were like, would be called like emo. Right. That has a different meaning now. Like, it's not like My Chemical Romance or something. It right, like, right. It was, <laughs> yeah. I don't know what that is, but, but it was like this this kind of hardcore where like a lot of things would get broken and people would really freak sure. out. It was like, but they were really like stylish. Like they had crazy outfits and like hairstyles and stuff. And You're right. Right. <laughs> it made a big impact on me as a teenager. And I, and then later in life, I got to know a lot of those people and be friends with them in real life. But yeah, so I went from Baltimore to playing these shows that were like that, which is like what I had been seeing pictures of in magazines and stuff, mm -hmm. but I didn't, had never been there. And from from there, it was there was really no going back in terms of was I going to pursue another job or another kind of lifestyle. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, how long did you? Well, how long? Yeah, obviously at that point you're like, okay, I got a I got a taste of touring. I love this, like. Obviously, you know, education can go kind of the side right now. You're going to pursue this, especially if you're touring the country, right? I mean, it sounds like you guys were you had some success that way. Yeah, I mean, I wouldn't say that we made any money, but we made, I guess we made enough money to pay for the gas to go on these trips. But, <laughs> sure. But, but to me, like, that was never, I guess that's because that's the background that I'm coming from. Mm -hmm. The idea of, making money was never really yeah hard. it was like an adventure basically mm -hmm. <laughs> it was sure. like, 
like if we can get if we can get to this other city and play and meet people that would it's like it's like how you would meet all these people that if you live there they would be your friends so it's like a it was like a whole pre of yeah it was like a pre-internet community where all these people throughout these different cities were all connected to each other that's cool that's yeah. awesome well, yeah, and then like, and not, like the i would say like the band I mean, Fugazi was from D.C. Mm -hmm. They were like a big part of kind of laying the groundwork for that kind of scene. And then another band that was like maybe more well-known than most was Unwound from Olympia, Washington. Mm -hmm. and they were like totally could have been like a like a it was rumored at the time that they would get offered a million dollars to sign with Virgin Records, but they would say no and stuff like that. But they. They were wow. like three piece band, totally amazing, totally like the futuristic version of Nirvana or something, but they just were purely underground. And yeah, there was a time when I called their booking agent on the phone because I had this, I subscribed to their newsletter, which was like this zine that you would get in the mail. Okay. And I called, and I called this number. I was like, whoa, what? I didn't even know what a booking agent was. Like all the shows that I had played, we booked the shows ourselves. Yourself, yeah. And then I called this number and talked to this lady. And I was like, I work, I go to school in Baltimore and I might be able to get some money from my school to set up a show. I want to book an unwound show. And she was saying that, oh, that's so cool that you're a fan and that you want them to play. Can you come up with at least $1,000 for them to play? And I remember being like, whoa bands that bands like that get paid a thousand thousand like bucks <laughs> we're like having toured a lot since then and been responsible for financing the tour i can see that that was like she was trying to hook me up because i was a teenage fan but mm -hmm. <laughs> to me that was like crazy that yeah like uh, unreachable like money <laughs> you're like whoa <laughs> that's crazy yeah because the yeah, the Fugazi in in DC they would they had all these rules like we only play all ages shows. Mm -hmm. A lot of only... their, most of their shows were benefits for various causes, and it was never more than five dollars. So, yeah, I was gonna say, was it Fugazi had a huge thing about never charging like more than five or s seven bucks or something for yeah. a show. Yeah, so that was a big deal. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's huge! Um, wow. Well, how long? Like so. How long did that band last? And then when did you start your solo, uh, the entrance? Yeah, I started writing songs. So, so yeah, when I said, um, it was like, it was all about the adventure or like getting mm -hmm. to go. It was kind of like, my definition of success was just getting to do this in as many places as I could kind of. Mm -hmm. And then, during that band which was there was three of us but it was a loud band and like my bass amp was taller than me you know it was like all its equipment and so we had a van and i started playing a lot of acoustic guitar at that time and getting more and more into things like skip james and robert johnson and sid barrett and mark bolin and all this kind of like just more minimal music and that's that's where I started to feel like if I really want to go places with the guitar, I should just go by myself with this one guitar. Sure. I don't need a van. I don't need a big amp. I don't need a drum set. And so like right around September 11th, 2001 was when I started that project. Oh like wow! I've been, been writing some songs at that time by myself and recording them on this boombox and stuff. And then, yeah, on September 11th itself, we were on tour, and we we're actually in Canada, so we had a whole ordeal. Trying to get border. back. Yeah. yeah. This story, I don't know how far into because this is we're still talking about 20 years ago right now, but like. <laughs> This story could be like a whole, I've actually thought about having my own podcast just to tell these kind of stories that I have because they're just so like, they're so interesting. But the, 
So yeah, we were we were in Canada. September 11th happened. We didn't have phones, obviously, so we were just listening to the radio and driving. Mm-hmm. And on our way to our show in Montreal that day, September 11th, 2001. And we got to the show and they were like, we don't know why you're here. We figured that you would definitely want to cancel the show. And we were like, you mean like, is this a big deal or something? Like we didn't understand that it was. Yeah. A big deal. Right. Then we, I mean, we hadn't been in touch with our family on a smartphone or something. So we hadn't, we didn't get a bunch like, Something like that happened right now. You'd get like a hundred articles sent to you if you weren't like, already mentioned. Right, right. It was like, oh, well, wait a second. They were like, you're American from the East Coast. We figured you probably are really freaked out and want to go home. And we were like, we came here to play a show. What are you talking about? So the show was canceled. Oh, wow. And then our next show was in Detroit. And we spent like, I'm going to say, Definitely over eight hours, but maybe like 12 hours at the border to get back into the U.S. Because that's a major crossing. I guess the the narrative was that Detroit is has a huge Muslim population. Oh, inter- I didn't know that. That's interesting. Middle Eastern people. And so the border was extra harsh there. And so everyone that was just trying to, that would have normally just driven across in a few minutes was there for hours and hours. Mm -hmm. We made it through the border. We got to Detroit. I don't know, like, I don't remember sleeping anywhere or anything. And then we were driving around the main kind of main drag of Detroit looking for a place to eat in this big van that's like a church van, just drive back and forth, back and forth. And we had been doing this thing on the tour where we would ask, mainly the drummer, George, would, would ask people these random kind of surrealist questions out the window to entertain us. Yeah, sure. Sometimes we'd be like, excuse me, ma'am, do you know the best place to go fishing around here? Whatever, <laughs> whatever popped into his mind, he would just say it. <laughs> we pulled up to these people at the stoplight and he was like, excuse me, ma'am, do you know where the GSA building is? And I was like, what is that? And I looked at the badges that the people were wearing and it said GSA on it. Oh, interesting. He was like, oh, I don't know. I was like, they had a GSA badge on and they looked really freaked out that you asked them that. And he was like, oh, I don't know where that came from. I guess I saw their badge. I don't know. Whatever. And then we kept driving back and forth looking for a place to eat. So we were in this dirty van. The GSA, by the way, is like the FBI or the CIA or something. You know, it's like a... Uh, like Gen- a government organization, yeah, General Services Administration. So it's like a, it's like a deep state organiz- organism. And we, all of a sudden, we're pulled over by like many, many cops with sirens blazing, blaring, <laughs> and we're held. <laughs> the guitar player Tony gets super belligerent right away and is yelling and stuff. And so they put him on in handcuffs on the sidewalk. And they oh had, my gosh! They had guns pointed at him, and there's TV news cameras filming it, and the cops are just grilling me and the drummer, and they're like, "Why do you want to know where the GSA building is? Why are you driving back and forth in front of the GSA building? What are you doing?" <laughs> yeah, they what thought you were like an attack them or something. Yeah, why do you have so much dirt under your fingernails? What are you a mechanic or were you making a bomb or something? <laughs> Like dirt under my fingernails because I live in this van and we don't <laughs> sleep. We sleep in this van, and you know. And then eventually, and so George kept saying, "No, I don't know what you're talking about. We didn't ask anyone anything." Mm-hmm. And I look out the window, and Tony's on the curb, and he's like, "You can't control me!" And like yelling all the stuff. Oh the- my gosh! <laughs> I don't know what he was saying, but so I was like, "Okay, it seems like I should just come clean." So I'm really sorry, officers, but, you know, we've been on this trip for a long time driving around and we just sometimes, just to amuse ourselves, we just ask people these random questions. So George here, he did say to these people back there, do you know where the GSA building is? But we don't actually know what that is. And he could have just as easily said, you know, where's the monument or do you know right. Do you know where we can get a milkshake or something? But he just happened to say that, and it was a coincidence. 
and we're really sorry because apparently that's a thing and we didn't mean to like draw attention to ourselves we we're just looking for a place to eat basically mm. and the guy says let me get this straight our american brothers and sisters i feel like i shouldn't it's funny but it's not funny because it's 9 11 but uh our, our American brothers and sisters are lying in a pile of rubble in New York City and you bozo punks are driving around asking people stupid questions. And I was like, yes, sir. That's exactly what it is. That's we're really sorry. <laughs> yeah. Just asking people stupid questions. It's totally stupid. We feel terrible now. And they were like, get out of Detroit and don't ever come back. And they basically with the siren escorted us out of Detroit. Whoa. And we were vegetarian and like the main thing that we would want to eat would be some falafel. We're passing all these amazing falafel restaurants and we're like, Oh, we can't go because <laughs> we're in Detroit middle, still. <laughs> it's middle, well, cause it's a middle Eastern restaurant and they think we're terrorists. And if we stop and get, falafel, oh. I don't know. It was really great. It was like That's... being in the eye of the hurricane. So oh then we left gosh. the city and we called from a payphone. We called the kid who had set up the show and he was like, we saw you on TV. Everyone had seen us on TV. It was like local news that oh my gosh, the crazy van was pulled over and that went yeah. Out there was a couple other things at that same time with uh, this band Godspeed You Black Emperor. Mm -hmm. They're from Montreal, but they're like a couple of them had really long hair and beards and kind of look like Middle Eastern or something. They kind of had like a gypsy. I think the guy's Israeli, but uh -oh. they had kind of a. And they're they're an anarchist collective, uh, and but but they had people calling the police, being like, "There's suspicious people in this gas station," and getting interrogated and stuff too. But it was a really weird time to be on tour. So the reason I even brought that up is because a couple of days later we were in Chicago, and I had a bunch of friends there. My girlfriend at the time lived there, and I just quit the band and stayed there, and that was kind of. When you started the when entrance, started, man? Yeah, when I started the, just the project of entrance, the entrance, which was just me for a pretty long time after that, for a few more years of touring and recording and stuff. And then um, you eventually gained a band, right? Or you formed a band? I, yeah, I moved to to so the the house that I stayed in in Chicago. Uh, Derek, who's the drummer for the entrance band, it was his house, and. Uh, he also plays on my new record and but the and eventually I moved to LA to start the entrance band with Paz who lived there but we actually all met in Chicago and uh and then yeah eventually Derek left Chicago and came to LA and we had a full on band and we were pretty active as a band in LA and in other places for a number of years kind of consistently mm -hmm. yeah up until like 2015 or so when our bass oh, player, wow. when our bass player paused what became the full-time basis for the pixies <laughs> like she's a pixie now <laughs> wow that's dope that's yeah. really cool so we've done a few shows here and there in the past couple of years but we're kind of like it's like a reunion. We're gonna play again, and we don't like have any new material, but we, we play all our songs and play shows and stuff. But that's cool. Yeah, so I've been more focused on my own stuff again, like kind of since since the band. And Derek, the drummer, also has two kids, and you know, it's like we're all still doing things together when we can. But it's more like for me to keep going constantly the way that I like to do. It's mostly doing it on my own. Mm -hmm. So did you go back to just being entrance or did you start going by your, by, um, your name? Or when I actually, did you... did. I actually made, yeah, a, the new record that I'm putting out now is with my name, mm -hmm. but I have, a couple, I have a couple other records from 2014 that are also with my name. And then after that, I made one record with the name entrance. That's, a solo record, but it also has both of them playing on it. Oh, cool. Other. So, but at this point, like I'm going to continue the, what, what I just figured out recently that kind of makes it, cause it's confusing. People get confused. Like I would go play, I would be playing a show and it's like entrance is playing and it's just me. And then people are like, where's pause and Derek? Like, what's, 
it's confusing. So it's less confusing for me to just be called at this point for me to just go by my name. Mm -hmm. So what I've done is taken the name Entrance and my label is called Entrance. Entrance Records and Tapes. And oh so, yeah, okay. Yeah. So yeah, it's just less confusing that way. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> Well, okay. So you have a new record coming out. I, um, I want to know where you were. I mean, when, when, uh, like COVID hit and everything, were you touring all the way up until then? Actually, was in, this is a whole other crazy story, but I was in, uh, I was in LA mm -hmm. and for the past few years, I had this job in LA where I did sound at this place called Zebulon, which is like, a, I would say, pretty new venue for LA like it's been happening for a few years before that it was in New York okay. but I would say it you know it's the definitely has been the best music venue in LA for quite some time and I didn't know anything about doing sound when I started working there but they trained me and taught me to do sound and so I was on my way to work I made this record that's coming out on Friday with mm -hmm. this friend of mine named Enrique Tena Padilla. He's another sound man at Zebulon. That's how I met him. Oh, cool. And, uh, and so I had already made the record and finished it. I was trying to figure out how to release it. And I wanted to release it myself, but I didn't really know how to do that. And so I was trying to find someone else to put it out. And... Then I was going on March 13th, I was going into work to do sound and it was, you know, the South by Southwest had already been canceled, been canceled. Before, and this other show that we were trying to do at this library where we did a lot of shows in LA had, ju we had just had to cancel. So I was like, sh asked my boss, should I even come into work or should we be open? And he was like, yeah, just come in. He's French. So he was like, yeah, just to uh, come in, uh, It'll be like I'm at 7.30 instead of 5 and I'll see you then. So I went to the grocery store and there was nothing at the grocery store. And there was a crazy line in the grocery store. And I saw some other friends from work there and they're very close friends. So I hugged them and all these people in the grocery store were like, like totally freaked out that we were hugging each other. Yeah, they're like, whoa. <laughs> I didn't understand, like, it just didn't dawn on me yet not to hug someone. Sure. So then, like, this is weird. And I sent my best friend in Baltimore a picture of the shelves with no eggs on it. And then I was like, okay, I guess I'm going to work. And I was, the next thing I knew, I was waking up in the emergency room. And I had, while crossing the street to go to work, like, directly in front of the venue, Mm -hmm. I got hit by a car. I was in the Oh my crosswalk. gosh. I was totally had I was had the right of way in the crosswalk. Mm -hmm. But yeah, I don't remember it at all. So I think I I think when the impact occurred I blacked out and was unconscious. And oh my uh, gosh. Woke up in the hospital some that was in the evening. So the next morning was when I woke up in the hospital. And my father was there. My father, who lives in Baltimore. Oh, wow. He, he, he was in the hospital, and I didn't understand like what, what happened. was going on. Yeah. Sure. Was, I was, so I had a concussion, and I was waking up in the hospital, and on the TV in the room was, I don't like to say his name that much, but Donald Trump and uh, Anthony Fauci were on the TV. Oh, talking about it? Like, basically declaring a shutdown. And my girlfriend was in the hospital and she, my dad was like, you can go home and get some rest. She had been up all night with me in the emergency room while I was mm -hmm. in contact. And when she left, they changed the rules so that she couldn't come couldn't back. Come back in. It was like, while I was in there, everything changed and I was relatively groggy and didn't know what was going on. But one of the things that stands out is that I saw the president on the TV and I had this really weird, unfamiliar feeling of sympathy and compassion towards him. Mm -hmm. I was like, oh, poor little guy. Like, he, this isn't what he signed up for. I was like, <laughs> yeah. no, wait a second. I must be crazy. Like, why am I? You know, it was like, because I'd never 
felt anything like empathetic that. towards them <laughs> or, or since really, but, but it was, like, <laughs> I was on, but I think I was on a higher plane of, and I think I had had basically a near death experience and, and was on a higher plane of consciousness. And I was sure. able to see him as just a person doing the best that he could and not like be mad at him. Mm -hmm. And I've tried to, you know, as much as I still 100% disagree with pretty much everything about him, I've tried to hold on to that perspective that it's not useful to hate anyone. It's better to try to understand them, basically. I don't know. But sure. <laughs> I'm glad you're okay, man. I mean, yeah. that's crazy. So, but so the, I'm calling from Virginia, where I'm on a farm that I've lived on since April. Oh, but, wow. So like the, the, when I came out of the hospital, I had double vision. So I had to wear this eye patch for, I, I stopped wearing it a couple of months ago, but you know, I had to wear it for like seven months. Wow. Cause I had this ruptured cranial nerve inside my skull. And so I didn't know this before, but cranial nerve, there's many of them, but some, one of them, uh, is responsible for taking the things that your two eyes see and fusing them into one field of vision. Okay. So that was damaged. So everywhere I looked, I remember I was wheeled out of the hospital in a wheelchair and I was like, Hey, um, everything's double. Everything looks double. And they were like, you're going to be fine. It's going to go. Yeah. I was just like, wait a second. And it took me a few days to realize that like I had a, like something no matter, wrong. Every time I opened my eyes, everything was double. So then was that, that must've been nauseating and like, I can imagine that. But, and then the lockdown was happening and we were in our house, not like going outside and you know, I was, had a walker and an eye patch and all this stuff. And then all of a sudden the, it was just like, let's move back to the farm in Virginia. We had been here on this farm where I am now uh, over Christmas mm -hmm. and all of a sudden my energy kicked in and even with the eye patch and like bruises all over me and, and everything, I somehow was able to pack up all my belongings and move out of my house cross get, country get on, get on a plane i was like up until we've got these flights to come out here i was thinking like well i can drive if my eyes go back to normal soon and it was mm -hmm. like it's gonna happen tomorrow because if it happens tomorrow i can drive right it right, was like, right it ended up happening like in august but oh my gosh but the or september but so somehow i had the momentum to just move really fast and do all this stuff to get out of there. Mm -hmm. and since then we've been in this pretty idyllic country setting and that's been really helpful for me. To, I, it's been, I think, you know, the accident that I had was definitely a part of the motivation for leaving and that's been really good to recover here. Mm -hmm. It's like the Los Angeles, still feels like my home, but it seems like very stressful. Yeah. Right now. Sure. Especially, I mean, it's still crazy there as far as like the cases, numbers and all that other stuff yeah. going on. But yeah, I mean, I, I feel like we've been pretty lucky to have a pretty almost like life here is kind of like what it, it's obviously different in some fundamental ways, but it's not that much different in some other ways than it would have ever been. Mm hmm there's not really anyone around anyway. <laughs> yeah, like, yeah, yeah. <laughs> fields with cows in them and fresh air and clean water. And it's like. That's it's awesome. Been, it's been really good. Yeah, that's um, great. So, but it is weird because I'm releasing this record and then I'm releasing another record that I made here after like a month later. That's like a oh, inst wow. an instrumental record that I made here on a four track. And I'm putting out all this stuff and like resurrected my label and I'm running this label and doing all this stuff, but it's all just happening through the internet and mm -hmm. there's no, no touring or live like, shows. Yeah. The venue that I worked at has been closed ever since. And that's where I would do a lot of shows. I would, you know, perform there a lot and book things there as well as doing sound. Mm -hmm. And it would have just been like obvious that I would do a record release show there. there. 
but it's like there's been not, there hasn't been a show there since March. Was, well, yeah, and uh, so it's weird. It's kind of changed my approach to making music in a way. Just to, it's I feel like I, I hear this from a lot of my friends who have who do different things too. That like we may not have chosen obviously for things to be like this or to slow down. Right. Not have been like, everyone, let's just slow down. <laughs> but when kind of forced or encouraged at least to do that, it actually like turns out to be a really good thing for a lot of people. I mean, there's a lot of difficulties with the whole situation as well. So I'm not like trying to say everything's great. Great. Right? Yeah. But for, for from an artistic perspective, for instance, like slowing down and having just more time to focus on creating things has been really good. Mm -hmm. And yeah, like I feel like it also shuffles your priorities around. And so, you know, moving away from this, like I never would have thought that I would move away from LA, but now I'm like, well, I lived in LA for so long and I had three jobs and like, Right. <laughs> yeah. I totally figured it out. I was able to support myself there and was involved in all these things that were happening, but I basically like rarely had a moment to of chill. Like downtime, right. Yeah. yeah. It's like tonight I'm doing sound at this show and then tomorrow I'm playing a show and then I'm doing this Hollywood catering job where I wake up at three in the morning and serve food to fashion models on a cliff and then I come <laughs> home and try to sleep for a couple hours and then I'm doing sound. It's like it was a crazy world. Oh my gosh. Yeah. And all in, in, in there writing records and recording albums yeah. and stuff. Yeah. And like a lot of the stuff, I mean, a lot of the songs on this record that's about to come out, I wrote them when I was traveling and trying to leave the U S so I was living in London for a while and then Paris for a while and then Brussels for a while and in all those places, like definitely considering trying to just, bail on the u.s and mm -hmm. stay over there and but yeah at one point a couple of years ago when i landed back in la i was like wait a second that makes no sense this is my home i was in the airport and i was like oh like if you live in la like lax is like oh yeah a nightmare no, not like oh great lax but i was like whoa lax is cool look there's jacob <laughs> dylan at the at the baggage claim like that's fine. <laughs> I'm done i guess i live in la now right know. right <laughs> it's like yeah so i mean i love it there but yeah all the things that i would be doing there none of them are allowed are happening to yeah it's really trippy yeah it's, and, it's definitely a, a weird time especially for for musicians and like you said you're gonna put a record out and there's no touring no playing it like yeah. one of the how, things one of the things that has been standing out to me because I'm like the label I'm the artist and the label mm -hmm. so I have to in, I have to engage with the business side or like kind of like the numbers side of of things a little bit more sure. much more than I would like to but you know I'm starting sort of trying to look for the positive side of that mm -hmm. aspect of it. And, and, you know, I've been making, releasing music for so long that I remember when there was no Spotify or there was no YouTube or whatever. And, but, you know, I could, you could easily be like, it's not fair. Music just isn't valued anymore and you don't get paid for it and everyone can just listen to it whenever they want for free but I'm a person that loves to listen to music and I'm really excited that I can listen to anything I want for free. Right. At any, any it's, moment. It's right. Amazing. And I think that from the perspective of someone that's putting a song into the world, it's been really cool to recognize that something that I, that I wrote and recorded and put all this energy into, into this one little file basically is now happening. People are, pressing a button and it's playing all over the world and it's mm -hmm. like oh like, 
174 people in Moscow have been listening to this song and I don't know them and mm -hmm. I've never been there. And so it's like, and people will say like, oh, I've been listening to your song in the gym or I've been listening to your song while driving. It's like the song basically has a life of its own. Mm -hmm. It can really be accessed anywhere and it becomes a soundtrack to all these experiences that other people are having that are totally out of my hands. And that's such a new thing that I feel like people aren't totally, people are more like bemoaning the way it's like unfair that they're not getting paid as much. Yeah, for... sure and, and, and there's things going on and ways for it to become more fair. I don't, I wouldn't just write that off, but, but yeah, just the fact that just digitally, that's something that you create just can go to places that you can't even go. It's really sure. amazing. Yeah, I'm, that is. I never thought about it that way. Yeah, like there's a hundred okay. plus people in Moscow listening to your song, and you're like, I've never been to Moscow. I think it's a time. I mean, I think a recording, more like a performance, is uh, there's there's no there's no substitute for a physical performance in a mm -hmm. space with an artist. Like there's something that happens with people in a room and with sound. I mean knowing what I've learned about sound from working with sound in all these different ways, sound is basically moving the air. So when you're in a room with people and the musician is playing and moving that air in the room and the people in the room are experiencing the movement of that air in real space, mm -hmm. that's just, there's nothing quite like that. But, mm -hmm. the, but every recording is basically like a time capsule or like, yeah, like a time travel device in a sense so like everything that i experienced that went into writing the song and all the ideas and experiments that went into recording it a certain way mm -hmm. like driving across the country to new orleans and being in new orleans to record the record and all the, you know all this stuff goes into this thing and then it's just this, it's like a little time capsule that can just go anywhere and then People are listening to it who have never been to New Orleans, but they're getting the feeling of New Orleans that I put into the song. There's, there's so many dimensions to that, and I think it's basically ultimately really cool to be mm -hmm. releasing it, to be releasing it at this particular time, and to see just how like the recording, just the power and the kind of dynamic nature of a recording in the, in this time is really cool. Yeah, definitely. I yeah, and uh, so you have the record coming out on Friday. Um, then you have another album you said that you already completed while while living there on your Virginia yeah, farm. Yeah, yeah, I recorded it here in June, I mean, from kind of from April to June, um, with my eye patch on and whatnot. <laughs> and uh, the it's called Double Vision, the album actually. Oh, and uh, fitting. Yeah, and yeah, it was like. The record that's coming out on Friday, I think kind of represents the culmination of everything that I've been doing up to that point, which is like really putting so much of myself into trying to write words mm -hmm. and basically like trying to tell a story. It's not necessarily just my story, but it's a story. Sure. But like I've always thought of song as a storytelling vehicle in a mm -hmm. sense sure and and i feel like that record that's about to come out is like maybe like the end of that entire thing it's like mm -hmm. the culmination and like climax of something and then the next one that's coming out shortly thereafter is the beginning of a new approach that i have which is not to say that i won't ever write songs with words again but right now i'm more focused on I mean, I guess it's more like composing than songwriting in a way, although sure. they're not, you can't really pull them apart. But, but it's like uh, there's a, like a therapeutic aspect of the music that I was using. It was like I was using it to heal myself. Like, uh, heal, yeah, sure. Yeah. That makes like, sense. Like healing music. Mm -hmm. And I've been learning a lot about music in that way and kind of focusing on putting that kind of energy into it so it's like i know that when i was a kid playing in punk bands the idea that i was basically 
would have said it was wrong. Like ma- <laughs> making right. me, making me, lyrics specifically for the purpose of calming people down and making them feel good. I would, I would have said, well, that's just like so lame. Basically. <laughs> yeah, right, right. Like music needs to make you feel like makes you, you know, needs to make you question everything you've ever believed and like overthrow the government or something like that. More, more yeah. So. <laughs> but, now as like a an slightly older person and also like having just been exploring it in all these different ways for so long I'm definitely getting more into the like the meditative or kind of contemplative aspect of it mm-hmm. and kind of thinking of it more like I'm making the film score than like I'm making a pop song kind of sure yeah, yeah. I love that. That's amazing. Um, well, and dude, thank you so much for talking with me today. I really appreciate it. Yeah, totally. Thanks, man. Yeah, I have one more question for you, guy. Before I let you go, though, I want to know yeah. if you have any advice for aspiring artists. Well, that's a whole other. That's a whole a whole podcast in, in itself. itself. <laughs> uh, uh, Yeah, I guess like each time you're working on something, remember why you do it in the first place, <laughs> and and the, not to tell anyone what their reason should be. But with me, for music, it's like if I start to forget that the reason that I play music is simply to play music, I get kind of lost. But if I practice and work on it in a way that's like this is what I do and I'm doing it now and that's basically all it is then all these things can come from that and like other ideas can be accomplished and and whatnot but it's really more about there's like a discipline to just doing it no matter what like uh like a writer is one who writes and a painter is one who paints and a singer is one who sings kind of like that idea Mm or like you don't always have to enjoy it but you have to because it's not always fun like a lot of the stuff that I've created I feel like was kind of torturous for me in a way but on the other side of it I I was elevated or released by it too so it's it's not just like have a good having a good time or something, but in a deeper way, I've always enjoyed it because I feel like it's what I'm it's my purpose or it's what I'm supposed to do. So I guess the advice would be like stay tapped in to your to your own voice and why you're doing what you're doing, and it's hopefully that's just because it's what you love to do. It's like yeah, that's. It's more like what what I love to do, whether I'm enjoying it at the time or not. But enjoying it is important too. And make the things that you would want to see, you know. It's basically like make the things that you wish existed rather than make the things that you might think that someone else would wish existed. Bring it back,